Uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my name is Shen Liu, a PhD student from the Pennsylvania State University. And today I'm going to talk about uh, our paper pointer split, which can generate, which can support general pointers in automatic program partitioning. And uh, this work is done under the guidance of my advisor, Gang Tan, and also Prof Professor Chen Jager. And first of all, I want to introduce the motivation of program partitioning. Why do we need that? So think about you have a monolithic security sensitive program, and inside the program you have some sensitive data. For example, it may be authentication file, or user password, or key files, whatever. And also you have some vulnerabilities inside the programs too. And if the attackers can take advantage of these vulnerabilities, Probably, probably they will get your sensitive data in the end. In the worst case, even a single bug can defeat the security of the whole application. And we believe this is absolutely we want to avoid. Actually, there are several ways for us to protect the sensitive data. From the perspective of program analysis, one thing we can do is if we can split the original application into multiple partitions and isolate each partition with some isolation mechanism, such as SGX, trust zone, or operating system processes, probably we can better the security. For example, if we partition the original application into two parts, and the right side is the input handling part partition, which means it still handles the user input, which may be malicious, and on the left side, the trusted partition still contains the sensitive data. If we do protection in this way, even the right side, the input handling partition is hijacked by the attackers, we still have the second chance on the left side if we add some security checks on the boundary between two partitions. So in this case, although some partition of a program has been hijacked, the sensitive data can still be protected, so which means we have a better protection. So now let me use a more concrete example to explain further what the programming partitioning is in a real program. So look at this toy, this toy encryption program. We have two global variables, cipher and key, and the key can be considered as a kind of sensitive data because later on we will use it for encryption. We have a function called encrypt. It has two parameters, a character string and the length of the string. And we'll use key, which is a sensitive data, to do encryption operation and write, back the, write the results to buffer cipher. In main function, it accepts the user input plain text, which is also a character string. Along function, it lays there's a buffer overflow vulnerability inside the main function. So in this case, even if the attackers can take advantage of the vulnerability, probably he can hijack the whole application, which means that he can, in the end, get the sensitive data key that he will want to protect at the beginning. So if we borrow the idea of program partitioning, one thing we can do is we partition the original program into two parts and put the sensitive data key and sensitive function encrypt into one partition on the right side and make them run on process A. And we put the left variable cipher and function main into another partition and let them run in process B. Whenever function main wants to call encrypt, it has to send the parameter and the buffer from the process B to process A. And when encrypt finishes its op in encryption operations, it will send back the result from process A to process B also. So if we do protection in this way, even though the right side is still hij is hijacked by the attackers, we can still protect the sensitive data key. In the past years, several works have been done to help automating program partitioning. Uh, they did a very good job. However, there is still one major limitation. 
which is the ORLAC automatic support for pointer data. We all know pointers exist everywhere in C and C++ programs. But the reasoning of pointers for partitioning the previous works is not sound. And also, after partitioning, when pointer data are passed across the partitioning boundaries, manual intervention is still required, not automatic. So why pointers will make things more difficult? Because first of all, if you want to do a sound pr program partitioning work, you have to reason about the program dependencies. When pointers exist, which, that means you have to deal with alias problem. And probably you will need global pointer analysis for tracking dependence on programs with pointers. However, the pro point, global pointer analysis is very complex and hard to be scaled to large C programs. Another trouble caused by pointers is after partitioning and during the inter-process communication phase, when pointers are passed across the boundaries, passing a pointer itself is far from enough because the caller function and the callee function now are in di two different address spaces. So if you want your partition program run as before, you have to pass the data the pointer points to also. And you release the underlying buffer along with the passing pointer itself. However, C -style, C -style, in C style languages like C and C++, pointers do not carry bounds information. That means during the runtime, whenever you encounter a pointer, you can only know, that, okay, I have a pointer, but you don't know how long the buffer, how long uh, the buffer is. So our work, Pointer Split, tries to provide automatic support for program partitioning with pointers. We did program partitioning based on program dependence graphs, which can track program dependencies. We bring in a new approach called the parameter tree. We use it to avoid global pointer analysis. And also, the program dependence graph construction becomes modular. We also proposed a selective pointer bounds tracking technique to track bounds only for necessary pointers. And the overhead is, is very low. Further, we do type-based marshalling and marshalling automatically because we can use bounce information right now to perform deep copying. The basic workflow of pointer split can be described in the following flow graph. Given some source code written in C, at the very beginning, we have to manually annotate about the secret and declassification point. And then we use the LVM compiler to compile the annotated source code into LVM IR code. After then, we use our PDG construction tool to generate parameter-based program dependence graph. Once we have such a graph, we can use our partitioning algorithm to generate two raw partitions. Here, raw partitions means there are only dead code and data cannot be run. And one is sensitive partition, which contains the sensitive code and data. And the other, the other partition is called insensitive partition because it doesn't contain any sensitive data. And then we use our select pointer bounce tracking to find the pointers that we need to care about. And then we use our type-based marshalling and demarshalling to automatically generate two partitions. One is a sensitive partition, and the other one is insensitive partition. Here we have already colored the key components in our framework, and we will introduce them separately. So let us first look at the program dependence graph construction part. So in our framework, we build a parameter tree based on PDG. This PDG can represent a program's control and data dependence in a single graph. We think the representation of a program's control and dependence is sound. And the construction process is modular because we use parameter trees. Here I need to introduce parameter trees specific, specifically because they're very important in our framework. Remember, points, pointers always making building dependence graphs hard because you have to use global pointer analysis. For example, if you look at the previous program, clearly there is a memory write in the main function. 
And accordingly, in the Cauli function encrypt, there's a memory read. That means we have to set up read after write dependence from the caller to Cauli. You think about you if, if you have a very large C program with a lot of pointers. So finding such a kind of data dependence uh, exists uh, among different functions. It will be a disaster. So can we try to find a way to be, still build a program dependence graph, but we don't need to use global pointer analysis? The answer is yes. And parameter trees can help us achieve that. The workflow of constructing a parameter tree is, for each parameter of a function, we build a formal parameter tree according to the parameter's type. And similarly, at each call site of a caller function, we build a parameter tree for every argument, which is also called an actual parameter. And then we can connect the caller function and callee function by connecting the corresponding nodes in the actual and the formal parameter trees. Actually, our parameter tree representation can be considered as a kind of generalization of the object tree approach, which was proposed nearly 20 years ago. But at that time, they didn't cover pointers at all, and the language level, but we cover. So we still use our old program example to show how a parameter tree looks like. Clearly in this program, function encrypt is a callee function. So we have to build tree, parameter trees for uh, every, every parameter of this function. It has two parameter tree, two parameters, so we have to construct the two parameter trees. The first the parameter is a char star. So we first can create a node, root node, to represent the pointer itself. Since it's a pointer, we have to create a subtree to represent the content the pointer points to. The second parameter is just an integer, not a pointer. So for, for, for this kind of data, the parameter tree will shrink into a single node. Similarly, in the caller function and the call side of encrypt, we build the actual parameter trees in a similar way. And after we have two kinds of trees, actual tree and formal trees, we can connect the corresponding nodes in the two different trees. And by doing this, we can connect the caller and callee functions, but we don't need global analysis anymore. Actually, using parameter trees can not only help us avoid global pointer analysis. Another benefit it brings us is it can help us reduce the number of dependence ages. So suppose you have n memory write operations in your caller functions and m mem memory read operations in your callee functions. In the worst case, the number of dependence ages between the two functions may be O n times n ages, which is a di di disaster, I think. But if we take parameter trees for help, we only need to connect those n memory write operations with the actual parameter trees. And similarly, we only need to connect n memory read operations with the former parameter trees. So in this case, the number of dependence ages will be reduced to O n plus m, not n times n. So if we do this iter iteratively, eventually, you will have a very clear and modular program dependence graph for later use. And this time we can start to perform program dependence graph based on partitioning. Here the input is just the sensitive and declassification nodes on graph. The output is two partitions. Each partition corresponds to a cut on graph and is a set of functions and global variables. So let me use a simple graph to show the basic workflow. So here, as you can see, each big circle represents a function. And each small node inside the big circle represents a program statement. The dash lines with arrows means the data flow between different statements. At the very beginning, we need to color some sensitive data manually. Here, we colored some data in F1. We also need to do some declassification to intentionally prevent the data flow from F2 to F5. 
And then we can do some research, uh, reaching definition like algorithm to partition the graph into two cuts. And the dot dashed line, green lines, is the partitioning boundary after the separation. Another key component in our framework is called selective pointer bounds tracking. Remember, why do we need to know the buffer size? Because when pointers are passed across a partitioning boundary, we have to do deep copying for pointers, not only for pointer itself, but also for the underlying buffers. Actually, how to calculate the buffer size is not a big challenge because there are a lot of existed bounds tracking tools for us to calculate. The real challenge is simply using this memory safety tracking tools will bring high performance overhead. For example, soft bound is a very popular bounds tracking tool. The performance overhead on the old specs to, uh, spec CPUs uh, programs is 67% on average. That means we have to do some opti optimizations. There are two things we can do. First, remember, we are not doing memory safety checking. We only need to know the bounce information during the run time. So we only need to do bounce tracking, but not bounce checking. Another thing we can do is we don't need to do instrumentation and bounce tracking for all pointers in a program. Instead, we'll only need to care about the bounds of pointers that can cross the boundary of partitions and the pointers that may affect these pointers. So let me use a figure to explain. So now we already have two partitions. And in the middle, the dot dash line is the partitioning boundary after partitioning. Each smart node here represents a pointer data. And it dash line, each dash line represents the data flow between pointers. Using selective pointer bounds tracking, it requires us to find pointers that are sent across the boundary. First, here clearly these pointers are P and Q. We call it a right. And later on, we can do backward propagation on our program dependence graph to find all bounds required pointers. So in the end, we only need to track the bounds of the red pointers, red nodes represent on the graph, but not of, uh, do bounds tracking for all pointers. And actually, it can help us reduce the overhead greatly. After we have available bounds tracking tool, we can start to do automatic support of marshalling and unmarshalling. Since partitions are loaded into separate processes right now, some functions calls are turned into remote procedure calls, and RPC for short. So when an uh, integer or float number is sent across the boundary, it's very easy because we already know the size of the data type. But when a pointer is passed across the boundary, previously we can't do that, but now we can because we have a bounce tracking tool to calculate the buffer size during the runtime. And after marshalling, all arguments of a function call are encoded as a byte array. We send it to the receiver under the help of the RPC library, and we'll finish the marshalling and the marshalling part. So next, I want to talk about the experiments part. We implement the pointer split on RM 3.5 because it can support both DSA pointer analysis, which is a very powerful intro procedure pointer analysis. And it also supports soft bound. Soft bounds can keep the bounds information as metadata for each pointer. And during the runtime, you can only directly get the base and bound address to calculate the buffer size for each pointer. We remove all bounds checking operations because we are not doing memory safety checking. So we only instrument the bounds required pointers. For our PC part, we directly use some TIRPC to help us uh, transmitting basic types. We did two kinds of testings. The first one is called robustness testing because we want to test whether pointer split is robust or not. And we also do security, sense, security testing with four security sensitive programs. Here I just want to use THDDBD, for example. It's a very tiny server program. And we colored the authentication file and the sensitive data. 
And we also de declassified the return result of functional authentic authentication check because the return result is just an integer. And we do believe by doing this, the information leakage is not too much. The most interesting part is if you don't do any selective bounce tracking, but uh, do bounce tracking for all pointers, the overhead is very huge, more than 50%. But after using selective pointer bounce tracking, the overhead is greatly reduced to less than 4%. TCPD has only 145 functions. And in the end, we only have five functions. All of these functions are marked sensitive. And the total overhead is 8.8%. And we believe this is acceptable. So this is a full table of security sensitive programs. And we use SSH, which is a client of OpenSSH. We also use WGET and Telnet for testing. We annotate the sensitive data and do declassifications one by one. So the most interesting part is to, once again, we show select, selective bounce tracking really works and can, and can help us reduce our overhead greatly. And also, the total overhead is always less than 10%, or it believes this is acceptable too. Except for security testing, we also test the robustness with spec CPU 2006 programs. We have to say these programs are not security programs, and we only want to use this testing to test the robustness and correctness. So we randomly chose some data as partitioning start. And once again, Selective pointer bounce tracking show is uh, good performance number. And the average total overhead is big because as we said, it's not a security, real security experiment. And we think pointer split can be extended in many ways. But here are some things we want to do in the near future. First, we want to add multi-threading support for pointer split because right now we can only handle single threading program, which is a big limitation. And another thing we can do is, since right now we can only annotate the sense of data and declassification point manually, so whether we can bring some automatic inference techniques to help us annotating the sense of data and declassification point automatically, if we do that, I think it would be a great work, and the pointer, soft split, uh, pointer split will be a more practical toolchain for everyone to use. So this is our work, and I'm very happy to uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, this is Tom Ping Liu from uh, UTSA. So I have uh, one question. So how did you select those data? Like, I, I mean, I believe I see that you said uh, manually select those sensitive data, yeah? Yes. Okay. If like, for instance, if you select more, whether they, they will increase the performance overhead or not? Uh, actually, in our experiments, what we choose are, we only choose one sensitive data. Huh? For, for example, in THDDBD, right? So okay. the data actually we annotated is uh, authentication file. Okay. Is this, whether a data is sensitive or not, it depends on your feeling, I mean, or it's very application sensitive. This is what I can say. Okay. I guess like if you choose more, then you yes, maybe yes. have more. Yes, yes. That means that you, probably you because have Because the propagation will be more, like the pointer you have to track will be more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 